everyone, and thank you for joining us for the sixth Tony Tripodi Lecture in International Social Work. My name is Melissa Begg, and I have the great honor of serving as the Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. The Tripodi Lecture ensures us the opportunity to reflect on trends, policies, and research in international social welfare and social work, including applications to social work policy, practice, and administration. This important lecture enables us to invite distinguished guests like Dr. Fred Suomala to join us. We are grateful for the generosity of Dr. Tony Tripodi, and we revere his outstanding example of our graduates' dedication to social justice, both locally and globally. His gifts to our doctoral program and the Tripodi Lecture Series in International Social Work, an area of growing interest to many of our students, are both an enduring testament to his contributions to the school and to the field. I would like to take just a few moments now to speak about Tony Tripodi, a beloved member of the CSSW community until his passing last year in 2020. Dr. Tripodi earned his undergraduate and MSW degrees from the University of California and was awarded a doctoral degree from Columbia Social Work in 1963. He went on to hold faculty and administrative positions at the University of California, the University of Michigan, the University of Pittsburgh, and Florida International University before finally becoming Dean of the Ohio State University College of Social Work, a position he held from 1995 to 2005. Dr. Tripodi was known for his deep commitment to global social work as exemplified by the many books and scholarly articles he authored, including a series on the conduct of research in social work. As his career unfolded, Dr. Tripodi never forgot the role our school played in his life. The school was fortunate to have a close relationship with him for over 50 years. He was honored by being inducted into our Hall of Fame in 2009. Thanks to his generosity, in addition to this lecture series, we are pleased that his memory is kept alive through a study room on our ninth floor doctoral program space that bears his name. Dean Emerita Jeanette Takamura has referred to Tony Tripodi as a giant in social work education and research. And at the time of his passing, the Dean of Social Work at Ohio State, Tom Gregoire, wrote that Dr. Tripodi was a mentor who saw potential in individuals before they saw it in themselves. It's a great characteristic for a mentor. Columbia Social Work colleagues have described him as a warm, caring, gracious, and gentle human being, and an avid opera fan. He was incredibly proud of his wonderful children and grandchildren. The Tripodi Lecture allows us to hear from visionary thinkers and practitioners about what global social work is and can be. We are deeply grateful to be coming together today with our esteemed guest speaker, Dr. Suwamala. So to get underway, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, today's moderator, an outstanding colleague and a treasured member of our community, Dr. Neeraj Kaushal. Dr. Kaushal is Professor of Social Policy at the Columbia School of Social Work, where she's been a valued member of our faculty since 2002. She's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a research fellow at the Institute of Labor Economics. An economist and a journalist by training, she's an expert on comparative immigration policy. Dr. Kaushal is recognized for her work on labor market impacts of foreign trained registered nurses and physicians, the impact of local policies on the health and mental health of undocumented immigrants, and the effect of the Syrian refugee crisis on electoral preferences in Turkey. Dr. Kaushal has authored or co-authored numerous peer-reviewed scientific articles and book chapters on immigrants and other vulnerable populations. Her most recent book, Blaming Immigrants, investigates the core causes of rising disaffection towards immigrants globally, and which challenges the validity of common complaints against immigration. Professor Kaushal, it's a pleasure to turn it over to you. Thank you, Dean Beck. It is truly my pleasure and really a privilege for me to uh, introduce today's speaker, Dr. Fred Sevamala. Dr. Sevamala is the William E. Gordon Distinguished Professor of Social Work and Public Health at the Brown School, Washington University. He directs the International Center for Child Health and Development and the Smart Africa Center through various NIH funded field projects and training program, Dr. Sevamala leads innovative interdisciplinary research 
that informs, develops, and tests economic empowerment and family strengthening combination interventions aimed at improving long-term developmental impacts for children, adolescents, and families impacted by poverty, health disparities, and in low resource communities. Currently, Dr. Sevamala, together with the iChat team is conducting seven NIH funded large scale longitudinal RCT across Sub Saharan Africa. He is, in addition, to three NIH funding training programs that focus on training early career researchers from underrepresented groups committed to careers in child behavior, health, and health disparities. His scientific work has been published, hold your breath in over 100 peer-reviewed journals. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sevamala. Uh, the screen is yours, Fred. Welcome. All right, thank you so much. Uh, my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Neeraj Kosho, whom I've known for, you know, for as long as I've been out of the PhD program. And I want to thank the Columbia community for inviting me to share uh, my work. And uh, and so before I before I uh, before I I, I, I I go on, I, I I think that you know I hope everyone can hear me. You can tell from my accent. I'm from a different country. I'm originally from Uganda. I spent my the first fifteen years. I studied here at Washington University, but then I spent my first fifteen years of academic career at Washington at Columbia University. Um, so I'm very glad that you have had me back to present and share what I know. All right, uh, so, so today's talk, uh, hopefully I'll get to, to do what really was expected. But what I wanted to do first is the, to, to thank a lot of uh, organizations that have funded the work that I'm going to be sharing with you. Uh, so it takes a village and really this work, it has taken a village to be able to get this work. But I also want you to know who I am. I, I was, you know, I was born in Uganda. I lost my mother at age three. So I don't know who my mother is. I don't have even an idea of how she looked like, but at least that's who she is. So, but I went to school. In going to school, I was raised by extended family uh, system in the country. So when you hear the word, it takes a village. For me, it really take, took a village for me to get to where I am. But I studied hard. I went to the university in Uganda, Makere University, from where I was able to get a scholarship to come and did my master's and PhD at Washington University in St. Louis. So each time I think about my life, I also think about our Nobel uh, Prize economist, uh, Amatya Sen. He's an economist, I'm a social worker, but I think this really represents what we are seeing in the world. And this is what he says. He says, we live in a world of unprecedented oppression. Let me get this out of my way. Uh, uh, sorry. We live in a world of unprecedented oppression of a kind that would have been hard even to imagine a century or two ago. And yet we also live in a world with remarkable deprivation. There are many new problems as well as old ones, including persistence of poverty and unfulfilled elementary needs. Many of these deprivations can be observed in one form or another, both in the rich countries as well as the poor countries. I want you to have that in mind as we go through this presentation. This is the other fact that I want you to have in mind as you go through this lecture. 20% or even slightly less of people in the world live in the developed countries or the dominated by the global north. 80% of people live in what you would call the global south or dominated by developing countries. 20% of the people who live in the developed countries consume 60% of the world's resources. 80% of the world population who live in developing countries dominated by the global south consume only 40% of the world resources. And then the 80% of the 60 consumed in the global north 
In most cases, it comes from the Southern Hemisphere. Those are facts. Unfortunately, some of these inequalities don't only appear in across at the macro level, but they also ap ap apply within countries. I think for Dr. Niraj, who is from India, she will tell you that inequalities, as much as there is progress made, the inequalities are huge. Even in this country, the inequalities are huge. So what is the role of global social work in all this? And I prefer the word global, we can substitute by that by international. Social work is a practice-based profession. I don't want to keep defining it for you, but I want to make sure that we are looking at this from the same lens. And really some of the principles central to social work are issues related to social justice, issues related to empowerment and liberation of people, issues related to human rights, issues related to collective responsibility and respect for diversities. When you hear some of those principles, that should put you in the mindset of what a social worker is supposed to be thinking about. Then when you talk about international social work, it has been defined differently, but let's take the definition of the National Association of Social Workers, which says that it deals with the universal problems experienced by people around the globe. And in fact, in the work that I'm going to present, you'll see that much of the issues that are faced in global, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa are faced also here in the US. Much of international social work practice occurs for people who want to be practitioners at the local, state, national, provincial, and regional levels. That's CSWE um, uh, definition. So as I go through this, I want you to have those uh, principles in mind, but I also want to, you to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, lecture that any social work student gets when they are starting either their masters or bachelors which is that the practice that we do as social workers, we practice at the micro level, we practice at the meso level, and we practice at the macro level. And so sometimes you hear these things of, I'm a, a, a clinical practitioner, because some people are thinking, you know, I'm only doing micro, I, I focus on an individual. But in my work, what I see is that some of those are very interconnected. Let's pause a bit. And I want you to think about this young girl. That young girl you see is in school, but that young girl is not of the web. That young girl is one of the girls that I work with. She's from what you see, she's from a very poor you know, background, but she's an individual, she's a human being that need, needs dignity. I want you to think about that young girl that she also has friends. She goes to school, so she's an individual. If you think about micro, issues, she's an individual, so you can intervene with her. But assuming that young girl had, you know, is a, has an issue, a social issue, I'm not saying she has an issue, but assuming she was HIV positive, and she's experiencing stigma, but she also doesn't have the money to go to pick up her medication. It means that by intervening with this young girl by herself, you have not moved a needle you need to intervene also with her friends in a way who are stigmatizing her. But also that young girl really belongs to a family, okay? So this young girl is part of a family, but this young girl is also part of a school system and part of a country. So I want you to have that in mind as we go through this. Have the definition, start with Amatia Sen's uh, way he really thinks about the world have the definition of social work, social justice and all that empowerment, but also think about individuals, not in terms of numbers, but real human beings so that you have a face. So these young people, among millions and millions of young people uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, then at any one time in history, we have the highest number of young people, ages five to 24, who are growing up in this region called Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa. And unfortunately, if you look at the demographic trends, they are not going to plateau soon. But also that young girl that I showed you and the families that I showed you, they live in this region, part of the global South called Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub Sub for some of you who have not been to Sub-Saharan Africa, it's one of the poorest regions on earth, where out of 700 and 36 million people who live in poverty, extreme poverty, 
413 of them live in that region called Sub-Saharan Africa. Think about it. So that's the deck we are dealing with for people who are really working in Sub-Saharan Africa and also working in these poor, poor regions that I, I mentioned as I, was, uh, as, I, as, I, as I was beginning. So, and that young person is one of the 51.7 million, I mean, percentage, uh, percent of young people who live in abject poverty, young people, not simply population. And this is not, you know, this is a, re these are recent statistics from about 20, 2016, 2017. But I don't want to bore you with issues because I, I, I know that uh, this, you all know this, but I also want to let you know that that young person is living in a region which is heavily affected by HIV and AIDS. Out of an approximate 37 million people who live with HIV, which is a killer disease, 24.7 or 25 million live in Sub-Saharan Africa. So yeah, that young person is in a region where they are exposed to the evils of living with the disease or interacting with people affected. Let's pause a bit and try to figure out what does 25, what does 25 million represent? Do you know what 25 million really represents? Think about, I, I want to bring you to the Midwest. Think about the entire population of Colorado, entire population of Missouri, entire population of Wisconsin as a state and entire population of Illinois. If you put those states together, that's what we call 25 million. Imagine if that entire region, people were living with HIV. Oh, think about your own state. Your own state, New York, where Columbia is located, is not even enough to tell us how, uh, what 25 million, uh, what 25 million represent. You have to put in another big state, which is uh, Kentucky for you to get to the 25 million. Now, we talk about poverty. You also talk about HIV and AIDS. There is no way people are living with poverty and HIV that they wouldn't have mental health, mental, mental health care, mental health difficulties. So, but when you look at the share of the mental health budget as a percentage of the entire health budget, the low income countries where we work have just a small percentage that goes towards mental health. That should concern us because of what we see as a recipe of really mental health. And then when you bring this to children that I work with, the untreated gap untreated gap of young people who have behavioral difficulties is huge compared to the treated gap, okay? So that should worry us, okay? Now, we know that these are also regions which have only less than one, one psychiatry per 100,000 people. So I'm setting up this, uh, this, uh, this, this background so that you know what the global south, what sub-Saharan Africa, what some of these countries are going through. Let's come to one of, they, they, they call this one of the major challenge, public health challenges. By March 30th, 2021, over 564 million vaccine doses were administered. But do you know where much of this is happening? This is where much of it is happening. North America, and we, we, we all agree that this is, this is a global pandemic. But look at what is going on, the doses administered per 100 people. So these inequalities that we talked about are real, and we know that poverty definitely has a link to the way communities get affected by HIV, get affected by uh, health functioning, get affected by uh, issues related to mental health and all that kind of stuff. But I think for so long, we have spent a lot of time putting poverty as what you call a control in our liberations. Yet, you can up, yet, when you look at, I'll give an example. When you give, look at where HIV, because you know, I work with kids, people who have been affected by HIV, I work with people who have poor mental health fun uh, functioning, I work with poor people, but look at the early, early years of HIV. What goes into your mind? 
you know, we are not in a classroom for me to ask that question. But really what goes into your mind is that we neglected poverty as a driver of some of what we are seeing. Look at 1982, first case identified. Until 2004, when I got funded, and I think 2000, if I, if I may look very well, uh, first publication connecting poverty to HIV clearly was in 2007. Start Googling that. And really, if we know that these poor countries are being affected by the disease, at least we should say, okay, I think there's something about this, this, this animal called poverty that is may, maybe bringing up about that. So um, uh, this is really to, to show you the early years of where the focus was. We, we spent a lot of time, oh gosh, my Zoom works, but it doesn't. So we spent a lot of time spending early years of HIV on condom use, treatment, uh, needle exchange, and that kind of stuff. Much of this was very biomedical, which was good. And then the other part was around issues of behavior. Any, any of you who does a, a HIV work knows that most of the, the theories that have guided the HIV field for a long time are very individual based. Eh? Issues related to you know, ABC, abstain, be faithful, use a condom. Issues related to around human you know, health belief models and that kind of stuff. But we spent less time on the structural causes until recently, I think until 2010, when CDC's report linked, made a direct link of poverty, uh, poverty being uh, related to HIV and AIDS. So the reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing out this is that we are also seeing the same thing happening with COVID-19. We can see where the inequalities are, but the issue of how do they access it and all that kind of stuff, I don't think we have done a good job around that, that issue. So in some of the work we do, using the principles of social work, using the principles of really public health and what we know, is that theory exists because I don't want to be, we don't, I don't work for an NGO I'm in academia. And theory clearly exists, which clearly indicates that when you fuse resources in the lives of people, people are more likely to engage with opportunities. I do work around adherence to treatment. And ART was made um, free in the regions where I work, but people were not adhering. And you know, there were lots of theories that, you know, people want to be like others, those ones who are HIV positive, then they forget, then they need to do this better. But we didn't real, we, not many people were talking about issues of what are the structural causes that are making it hard for these young people to be able to access treatment. So some of the work we do, um, is really to figure out, can we use economic empowerment interventions in addition to other interventions for us to see whether we'll see a difference in health outcomes. And when you are doing this work, okay, because you know that this will take a village, you can't just focus on an individual, you have to think about how about their family, the family member, how about civil society? Because most of the people that we work with interact with non-government organizations. And we know that the role of non-government organization is to address the gap between what the government can provide and what they can't provide. If the government can provide everything, we don't need non-government organizations. But because we know resources are scarce and sometimes the government is not able to provide everything, you need that fourth arm. And then you also need to work with the media you need to work with the business sector. I think this has been very clear during COVID that you saw, is it Pfizer, Moderna? These are really, these are business sectors, but they came together for common good. So that's how we have done our work and we continue to do our work. And so I'll take you through some of the work we've done and how we have applied this. And all our work, because we know work with poor people, we work with people who are vulnerable. We work in the global south. We always have to justify that. Are you sure people will engage? So when I was still at Columbia University as a junior faculty member, I launched um, this work, which is around economic strengthening as part of the combination interventions. And this work really, it grew over a period of time 
as you can see, but this is the work that I started with. And in, in, in designing this work, although I wanted everyone to benefit, I had to make sure that we, have, we can rule, rule out the counterfactuals, that we can say, if it wasn't because of the intervention, we wouldn't have been able to achieve that. So that work really allowed us to be able to set the framework. And we saw that the young people and their families were able to engage with financial institutions, that they did, just didn't want handouts. They wanted to be part, to be quote unquote empowered, to be part of the development process. But we also saw that these interventions that we are doing, which were around economic strengthening, that where they were addressing material hardships. So they were addressing health and mental health functioning. And this work was published extensively, working with my former students, current students, and all that. Okay, So they were published across. That was good. But that work was also knowing that you, if you are going to drive policy, you cannot use small numbers. That work had a limitation. It was short term. The sample sizes were small. And people were asking me, Fred, you are talking about you know, economic strengthening, are they cost effective? How much would the government need to spend? Because again, if you are dealing with low income families, poor people, vulnerable populations, that's when issues of sustainability come in. People always want to ask you, are you sure that is sustainable? So if you don't address the cost question, the costing question, then it becomes a problem. So that launched me and my team and my colleagues that I work with into this long trajectory of work, where we now started applying for big RO ones with including a costing component. So they are still economically empowering families, but we are also interested in knowing how much will it cost them? What is the efficacy, but what is the cost? Okay. Now, as we did this work, we also saw that you know, at some point, much of this work is being driven by the global north. The theories we're applying are the global north theories. So that made us think about training grants and training components so that we can start thinking about training a new cadre of researchers that can engage with Sub-Saharan Africa, but some of them that can come from Sub-Saharan Sub Africa and the global south overall, like, you know, for them to be able to engage in some of these kinds of interventions that we're doing. Because it's very clear, and you'll see in the, in the slides to come, that only about 35% of publications, a recent actual Lancet report indicated that about less than 35% of publications are led by people from the global south or from the developing countries where we do much of the work. So that uh, I want to take you through. So this study was situated in schools. We worked in 48 schools with an N of about 14 and 10. And in that study, we wanted to figure out, can young people really, over a long period of time, engage with these economic strengthening interventions and at what cost? Then we, 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 we went on and also addressed another key question, that for young people who are HIV positive, who are really saying it's because of money, they don't have money to get to the clinic, they don't have money to afford the medication, uh, whatever goes with the medication, although medication is free, but they don't have the money for them to be able to afford the meal that you have to take with these very heavy medications. If we economically empowered them, will they, again, using social work perspective of empowerment, will, they, will we see a difference in adherence to treatment using real biomarker measures? Then the other study was, we see some relations, some differences in terms of outcomes around girls. Can we really understand what is going on with the female participants? And so we designed that big study, five-year study, specifically looking at young girls. How can we engage with them in this kind of in this work? Then we designed another, another big study, uh, which is a, a, a Smart Africa with our colleagues, uh, Dean Mary McKay, uh, Kimberly Hogwood. Uh, others, you know, I have colleagues here working with me, um, uh, uh, Senso Ibaha uh, Ozki, uh, Prosi, and others. And so in this study, I already gave you an idea of what do we have in terms of the number of psychiatrists in the Sub-Saharan African region, given the mental health need. So this study in Smart Africa was about 
trying to figure out the task shifting model. Can we train, not everyone needs to say psychiatrist, but can we train community healthcare workers? Can we train uh, peer parents? Can we really think about this at a more, you know, more global level in a way, if I may use that word, and see what works in Uganda, is it different than what works in Ghana? What works in Ghana, is it different from what works in South Africa? Or are they the same? And how would we implement these task shifting models? So, and other studies are, you know, uh, around still adherence to treatment, issues of stigma, but I won't spend time on that because I want to be able to take you through a concrete study and then see what the outcomes that, the outcomes that we see. So the study that I want to take you through, which has been published and, you know, just to put in a plug, there is a paper which just came out in the American Journal of Public Health, and that really uh, chronicles our five-year findings beyond the intervention, and I would definitely encourage each one of you to read it. Uh, but other work has appeared in adolescent health, prevention science, and, 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 and others. But really what we did in that previous study was trying to get a group of young people across 48 schools. We randomly assigned them to three arms. One of them was usual care, which is normally the scholastic materials that people give when people are in poverty or they are, they are, they are, um, they are orphans or stuff like that. And then the other arm, the other two arms were ones that really included an asset building component, a component that taught young people on how to save money, how to invest, but also it talked about sexual education. So using the frame of combination intervention. Really, at the end of the day, we had these three arms, one of them is usual care, the other one is a one-to-one -one match rate. We say, does the incentive matter? How much you give you incentivize someone? Does it matter for them to engage? and for us to see meaningful outcomes in terms of health, education, sexual taking behavior, and, and all that. And then the other arm was, so we, we, we varied the arms by one of them getting less of an incentive and the other one getting more of an incentive and the other arm was purely um, usual care. And really what we saw is that consistent with our earlier studies over five year period that these young people and their families were able to save. That these young people and their families, I want you to pay attention to the green and the, the, uh, the green and red. That these young people, these savings were making a difference and investments were making a difference in, in their depression, in their hopelessness. People who are hopeless, they will do stupid stuff, unfortunately. But we are, you are building hope. So that level of hopelessness was going down compared to those in the control arm that also these young people, when you look at self-rated health, they were doing better on all these outcome measures. So when it comes to education, they did better for the, these young people who were in our treatment arms. So overall, when you look at eight outcomes, okay, eight outcomes, young people in the treatment arms did better than young people in the control arms. But the question was, at which cost are you getting those outcomes, Fred? So we did a costing, comp a costing which was prospectively done. Actually, I want to thank uh, Afga Finko, who is part of uh, Columbia University School of Social Work. Uh, we designed this with him and also Jen Ward Fogo. So we designed the, this component with, with, uh, with these colleagues of ours, of, of mine at the time. And we have published this work both in, in, in adolescent health, but also recently in PROS1. And really what we see is that it doesn't cost much to change health outcome. But if you incentivize people, people who got more, slightly higher incentive, you know, they did better actually compared to those ones who got a slightly less incentive. But at the end of the day, the amount does not make one rubber bank in a way. So this, this can be done. And also when you look at mental health, these young people, we are doing better in terms of when you look at the two arms, one which is incentivized highly and one which is incentivized uh, in a uh, slightly lower. And again, this work is, uh, has been published and I'll be happy to send you the outcomes on this. But you know, these are standardized outcomes. So 
What we saw recently in the PROS1 paper is that actually the effects were sustained over a period of time, two years beyond the intervention. We also saw that a slightly higher incentive yielded a slightly significant and lasting effect on outcomes. But we still have questions that we haven't answered. And those questions are around the implementation. We don't know what is the optimal, for example, what is the optimal intervention, whatever active ingredients in the intervention? We haven't really addressed that question. And you know, social workers should be able to think on public health practitioners. How about longer term beyond five years and six years and seven years? Because you know, and then the cost benefit question, not the cost effectiveness, but cost benefit question. Knowing that many of these young people are now graduating from universities in terms of getting a job and employment and that kind of stuff. So that's a, st a concrete study that I wanted to take you through so that you know how we apply these economic empowerment interventions. I want to take you through another slightly different study, which is around, which is situated within clinics. And it's the one I talked about regarding ARV treatment where you know public health is part of what social work needs to do. But if young people are given an opportunity to access treatment, but they're not accessing it, the question is, what can we do? And you really, you, you read literature, some of them say, oh, they forget a lot because these are adolescents. Oh, they want to be like any other person. Oh, but there are issues of stigma, but there's also issue of cost. And so the question was, if we address the, quest, the, the cost question of can they get there and they have the meals that they need to take this very heavy medication, will, they, will we see a difference in terms of medication treatment, adherence to treatment? And really what we did was to use different measures of adherence for us to be able to tell and be able to inform the field. And I want to report that this is one of the few studies that have found an effect on viral load, even using conservatively a conservative cutoff of 40 copies per meal. And we found that kids in the treatment arm were nine percentage points higher to have a virus suppressed, uh, to, to have a viral suppression compared to kids in the control arm. This is huge because not many studies find uh, this kind of work, uh, this kind of um, impact. And we have published this work extensively. And, uh, and really to me, it was still bringing up my upbringing of knowing that poverty is key, but also knowing that, yeah, that we need something beyond simply these individual level uh, factors, that we need combination interventions. And that's what really I've been uh, trying to do. So, Let's think about one other area that I want, uh, if you could bear with me another maybe you know 10 minutes. Now, this is exciting work, but may, again, uh, many of the theories that are guiding us are from the global north. But also the publications, if you pull up most of the publications around this work are from the global north, really led by the global, the global north. So it's documented that Across different fields, we still lack the capacity in the global south, be it infrastructure, be it actual training, for us to equip people with the training they need for them to compete favorably in, in academia. And I already talked about that recent Lancet report. And we also know I'm African, but we also know that few African scholars on the continent are able to compute to compete for extramural funding. So for me, knowing that most of the interventions that we are doing in the region are being guided by theoretical models originating from the global north, the question is how can we think about cultural congruence without involving people from the continent? So for the past several years, we have been able to engage young scholars that are interested in these areas, but that are also from the continent, building a pipeline of young, uh, young scholars or new investigators that will be able to take this work to the next level than simply always depending on the global north. We also have been able to apply to a D43. We are now, this is a D43, which is being run here at Washington University. You know, I have colleagues like, you know, Bets, uh, Bets Abenti and Laura, these are the people that really uh, are running this, this study. But I've also partnered with Makere University 
for us now to think about medical doctors that are interested in issues around HIV and AIDS. Uh, PhDs that are interested in these issues so that they can be trained early for them to be able to drive, quote unquote, the car in that lane of the global south. Okay, so that's another way of empowering communities respectfully. So we have also been able to apply to NIMHD and think about communities in this country that are interested in learning from Sub-Saharan Africa because there's a lot of, around the, the bi-directional learning. So these are young scholars underrepresented in their own category that are interested in these issues. Either you're working in inner cities here which are heavily affected by HIV, mental health and drugs and all that. And then there's a lot they can learn from Sub-Saharan Africa and bring it back here, or they can learn from here and take it there. So these are some of the recruits that we have, and this is funded the five-year training program that we are, we are doing around capacity building. Then we have another one, which is an R25. And again, this is for us to be able to engage young professionals in some of the work that we do around public health in, in quality, inequities. And these are being trained again through Washington University. And this uh, we are running this work with Dean Mary McKay, Shan Jo, and myself as co-directors. But knowing that we need the empowerment should not only be empowering community, but we need people from either the region or underrepresented groups to be able to take the steering. So with that, I want to plug in a few, a, few, a few items and then I'll stop. We are also very much interested in dissemination. So when we disseminate, every year we need to make, we make sure that we produce a report, but we also do a conference. Because simply having preaching to the choir, I know that I'm preaching to you guys, you, you, are already, you already know about some of these issues. But there are also lots of people who have never thought about the issues that I've highlighted here. And they're not necessarily social workers. Some of them could be social workers. So in all my work and our work here at ICHAD, we try to make sure that we disseminate this work through different forums. Of course, I already showed you the work that we disseminate through uh, the publications, but we also have reports that we produce. We also have conferences that we organize. These are well attended. This is, can you believe this was before COVID? We're all, you know, that's before COVID. So, but this work also will not be impactful unless we engage with policymakers. The person I'm interacting with here is the Speaker of Parliament in Uganda. We are very lucky to be invited to contribute to the mental health care bill in the country. And, uh, and really that was a great achievement. And really right now what is also happening is that we are trying to figure out a way of, of incorporating now these economic strengthening interventions across the country. But are they, because I talked about micro, meso, and then macro. At the macro level, global, at the regional level, we were invited to be people, some part of the team that contributed to what you hear as the dream study. The DREAMS project is in over 10, you know, over 10 countries, if I, I hope I didn't misspeak, maybe eight across the region. But you know what is included in the DREAMS study? They are focusing on young girls, which I like very much. They are focusing on savings. They are focusing on entrepreneurship, vocational training, things that we started focusing on back in 2004. So for me, being invited to be part of the consulting team that was extremely exciting. Then this work, uh, I, you know, this work has been extended to other places around, you know, uh, uh, savings. And I work with a colleague of uh, my colleague, a friend, uh, Susan Witty, has put this work, he has uh, pushed this work to Mongolia. As uh, you know, some of you uh, who know Susan, um, a colleague, and we have also done this work. Now we are doing this work with Susan also in Uganda. But also we have a news, we have a student from one of our T37s who is taking part of this work to the Kagsi Republic, okay? So we have taken this work to Ghana. We are now implementing this work in Malawi, Nigeria, Kenya. So the good thing is that we started micro with that young kid that I told you about. And then we are really seeing how you can go from that small, focusing on that small one child to getting regional and then now global. 
let me put in one last plug. Many of you are always asking me, but you know, why, why just Africa? I, I got this from a colleague of mine, um, Benjamin Yakande, and I'm sure I got this map from somewhere else. So I don't, I don't want to say I take credit for formulating this, this, this map. But did you know that Africa, and maybe some of you already knew, no, but I didn't know, frankly, that Africa is bigger than China, India, the United States, and most of Europe combined. So when I talk about the global South and I focus on Africa, you know that we are making a dent, can make a dent, that there's still room for each one of you to be able to engage with Africa and to engage with the global South. And I'll stop there by telling you that it takes a village. You saw the building this board of work, it took a village. And it's a long list of people that have worked with over a period of time for us to get this work to where it is. Uh, on teaching, I'll tell you one thing that I'm very skeptical about short-term courses, which are dominated by spring break where you have students going to Uganda or to Kenya for two weeks and they come back and write books that they're experts. So I really think that you need a real engagement with communities for you to be able to move the needle and to impact and the places that we need to impact as social workers. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Fred, for that very, very uh, inspiring uh, presentation. Your work is really remarkable from uh, research to uh, training students and then impacting at the ground level. I am flooded with questions that go from uh, how people can participate in your work questions about your life as well as uh, um, as well as research questions so let me ask you start with the question which I'm sure has be you have been asked many times before how can social workers get involved with your project and replicate them in the New York area New York City area uh, so I, I have to put in a plug here that uh, I have a colleague called Proskovia Nabunya who is trying to get you know, real global work, bring some of what we have learned from Uganda and bring it back here in Missouri. And I also tried to do this work when I was still in New York. Uh, I was funded by uh, University of California in San Francisco as a visiting professor. And we did preliminary work around in the Harem and South Bronx to figure out what would it take for us to think about some of this that we have done so well in the developing country? And actually, Jane Ward Fogo and I, you know, I was uh, Jane, Jane Ward Fogo was my mentor. So if you see her, please pass on my regards when I was at Columbia. We were trying, um, I was trying under her, uh, her mentorship, I was trying to get this work among young people who are in the foster care system. And so how do we prepare them with these resources and kind of, um, so, they, 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 so to answer your question, I think there are opportunities uh, for us to be able to get this work, learn from the global south and bring it here. So how can we do it? I think it's a matter of either an email for us really to think about deeply because I can't just say, oh, you know, I'll, you know it's, you begin by either writing a grant or really figuring out how can we apply that work here. And, uh, and I've been you know, thinking about it. And I know that Pros is thinking about it. She has actually an RO1, I think either under review or a submission coming up soon to be able to bring some of that work back here. But uh, I think through the trainings and interactions and reaching out, we can bring that work back here. Um, so I don't know whether I answered your question, my apologies, but, uh, but uh, it's, uh, yeah, it will, yeah, so it will, I don't have a clear answer that let's do A, B, C, D, but it's, it, it goes through discussions probably for us to figure out. No, no, I think you have answered. I mean, you've already done it uh, through your work uh, by involving students as well as uh, by bringing some of it, doing it in uh, New York City. Uh, my second question again uh, is uh, from the audience and that too, you may have been asked before, which is how did you, it seems like you started initially uh, domestically and then uh, moved internationally. What were the challenges? How did you start? So uh, like where I started, I, I mentioned that I'm, I'm from Uganda. So I'm from the African continent. I was born poor, I grew up poor. So I always tell people whatever I have is in excess of whatever I ever dreamt having. 
By the way, I also think that, you know, I've already passed our life expectancy in my country. You know, I think at some point, I didn't send off my parents because, you know, at 38, you are dead, I'm beyond 38. So I'm very realistic. And that even if I was trained in this country, I always knew that the way we looked at challenges here sometimes is too simplistic, that you cannot simply use you know, simply people are forgetting and then they, it's a bit simplistic for someone like me who grew up poor, I knew that it's beyond simply one, one intervention. That's why I think about combination interventions. I will never tell you that savings accounts or economic empowerment by itself will solve it. No, you need a combination of kind of interventions. You need a multidisciplinary group of people, economists. I work with economists. I work with medical doctors, I work with psychologists, I work with social workers. So you need that kind of stuff. And that's what I realized are enough. Mm -hmm. My dissertation was purely here, like you identified, you are right. My dissertation was based on welfare moms here in the US mm -hmm. under the, under the, um, under the, 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 my doctoral dissertation chair was Michael Sheradin. But Michael's work had never been applied in the situation that where I'm applying them. So for me, knowing the principles of social work around economic empowerment, innovation, and that kind of stuff, digging it and that kind of stuff, the, the, the great stuff that I, I showed you at the beginning, that's when I started thinking and, and I said, this can be applied in other settings that are poor. And so when I traveled to Uganda, that was in the, around 2000, I found there were lots of kids on the street. And although I grew up as an orphan child, I was never a street child. And so the question was, what has gone wrong with the family fabric in the country? And so that's when really I thought about how do I apply what I've learned in the US back in Uganda? And, but then I was not going to work with street children because I, you know, I'm not a politician, but uh, my, my president says, I was listening to him one time and he said for boxers, when they are boxing, what they do you put, you try to take your best, you know, you, you can't fight like this. You will be knocked down. You have really to, to get your strength in one arm and punch and then get a knock, knock down. So for me, I decided that if I'm going to be, to be relevant and really to make sense, it was, I was going to work with families, not with kids on the street, because if I worked with kids on the street, I'll be telling them that send your kids on the street, then I'll intervene. It doesn't mean that people working with kids on the street are wrong. For me, I decided that let me avoid, let me tap, uh, how do you take, turn off the tap. Let me make sure that these kids don't get from, from, the, from, the, from their families in the villages to come onto the street. And let me make sure that families know that if, you, if you, you know, you're economically empowered, these kids are not going to be on the street. And that's a fact that we know that if you intervene, I have another colleague of mine, uh, her name is uh, Ozike Sensoi Baha. She's doing work in Ghana and she's doing work around child labor. And most of these kayas, these kids who go to the, the, the pull factor and the push factor, it's around poverty. So they are pushed into the street. So the point is I started here, but I was clear that this had applicability in the regions that where I work. So that's, that's how I started. Well, I must uh, say that you look uh, not a day older than 38. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. Um, there are a few questions that really want to ask you about how do you measure efficacy in projects for strategic planning and uh, for grant re renewals? That's actually an extra excellent question. So in measurement, we have of course established measures but you also have to set up exactly what do you want to see? Because you know, in, in academia, you're guided by theory. And so, but also you want to think about now the statistics arm comes on in terms of the effect sizes that you are expecting or that would, would make sense. And that's why in all our studies, or I don't have any study which doesn't use a randomized control trial. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because I want to be able to tease the, what would have been achieved without me intervening? Maybe you don't need me. So what I do is, first of all, I need to make sure that we're not for sure that without the intervention, this would not have been achieved. Then two, 
how are the kids that didn't benefit performing compared to kids that benefited? How is how has the community received this? Can the community take this on even without me? Like for example, like what family communities are telling us with Smart Africa, which is really a manualized intervention, which brings community uh, families together and they talk about issues of respect and issues of, um, I, you know, there are the four R's and two S's. I, I don't know all of them. I always uh, lean on my colleague, uh, uh, Osge, who helps me go through that. But today I didn't invite her here. So, but you, you figure out that, that can the communities take this on by themselves also? The communities are telling us, yeah, if you leave, this money will remain in schools. We'll be able to do it. And we have seen that kids who participated in that MFG are doing better compared. So really what we have looked at in terms of efficacy is uh, looking at comparing the treatment arm to the control arms. How, what differences do we see? What are the effect sizes of these interventions? And uh, can this even be able to be, to be carried on further? But it's mainly comparing the two, the two or three arms that we always work with. And that's why I always design uh, trials and with uh, other cities. I don't know, you know, so yeah, so that's what we do. And that's how we can always tell that our intervention is superior to what is being provided. Mm -hmm. Well, your work is truly uh, very, very impressive. So, I mean, I think one of the questions that is also there asked by one of the uh, our um, viewers, and I was also thinking of it, you know, during pandemic, everything has kind of stopped. How has it affected your work, uh, all these projects that you're doing in Uganda and uh, in the US and elsewhere in the world? So I was take, telling uh, Melissa Aria and, and Julian that, you know, I used to travel to outside the US about six, seven times a year. I mean, really, literally I was, you know, one of those frequent flyers. I knew what time to get off and get on and all that kind of stuff. But since COVID, I've not gone out. And with all the evils of COVID, we have been able to, to know that there's a lot we can do virtually. So part of what we do is that we, when we, we are working in a region, we set up offices in that region. We, we, we are not people who fly in and out. We set up real operations in that region. We hire people from that region. We train people from that region and we engage with them for them to be recruiting, interviewing, publications. That's why I'm extremely very, very interested in issues of capacity building. Mm -hmm. And so when COVID came, what we did was to cut down on my travel because it was, you know, the university wouldn't allow us to travel. Even my wife couldn't allow me to travel anyway because she didn't want me to bring back the COVID. And then we reconfigured all our offices and we put them on Zoom. So we now have fully fledged offices where we can link into Zoom easily. So that is in terms of administrative level. So all our offices have clear Zoom and we, are, we, we did that. So the money we would have spent on airline, whatever, we're able to do the Zooming. Now, in the actual field, Uganda, Kenya, Ghana, they were in lockdown. And so one of our studies for which uh, Susan Witty, you know, your colleague at Columbia is one of the co-eyes, the, the co-PIs because we are it's a MPIs. We had to go back to NIH and tell them that look here, part of the intervention we are going to deliver, we can't deliver because of COVID. And then NIH was able to work with us. And then instead of having three arms, we ended up having two arms, but that really did not uh, undermine the rigor of our work in a way. So it was simply combining two arms. One of them was supposed to have, you know, vocation training and, and direct mentorship and that kind of stuff. So we maintained part of that, but there's a small element we took out and we combined them. Then when it came to interviewing, what we decided to do was to train our research team on telephone interviews. So because normally what we do, we interview people in person either use an iPad and then they put blah, blah, but you, we go in, you know, we meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. So we moved away from that. We applied to IRB and we told them, look here, for the next year, 
we, uh, we request that we continue interviewing so that we can get that time train data, but we use telephones. So what we did, we bought 50 smartphones. And when we bought those 50 smartphones, so what we would do was a research assistant would go to the community, give it to the participant, and then they would go either in the car or whatever. And then the participant would be able to call, no, the, the team in, in the office would be able to call the participant on that line and they'll do the interview. So we did that creatively and it allowed us to continue to follow these participants um, using telephone, which we provided. Because we, we didn't just want to say, oh, we'll use telephone. We don't know whether everyone has a phone. So we bought the phones, we'll take it to them. They would, after finishing the interview, they would give it to them in the polythene bag. Then we'll take it, disinfect it, so that still work continued. So I want to report that even with COVID, we have uh, our, attrition our attrition rate is not anywhere more than 8%. So which is extremely exciting. The only, we have one site where we have had a big attrition rate, but it's because the women we are working with who are women engaged in sex work, they traveled to Rwanda and they are locked in Rwanda now. So because, you know, are, this is the mobile population. So one of the site is putting our numbers. But other than that, we've been able to adjust and um, very well. And probably that's part of the social work training or public health, but social work training of community collaboration because we collaborate with communities from the word go. So we are able to know and the communities trust us. So that's what we have done at the administrative level, at the research level and implementation level. Wow, wow, that's truly impressive. I mean, it just shows where there's a will, there's a way. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add also is we are the training. You see, we have those trainings programs, and these are summer training programs. So for the participants, for our trainees who are supposed to travel to Uganda and to Kenya and to South Africa and to Sierra Leone, they didn't travel. And the reason is because, you know, there was no travel. So what we did was to go virtually and we did everything virtually, including mentorship and that kind of stuff. And it worked out well. In fact, even this year, we just recruited another cohort. So we combined three cohorts together, uh, three training, you know, three groups together. We have recruited them and we are still going to do it virtually because of COVID. So we have been able to adjust uh, even with the training programs. No, this is truly impressive. And I think uh, many of our viewers who are, uh, they would all want to go and do some international social work. And my next question is related to that. So what would be your advice uh, for someone who's looking to start uh, uh, working in an international setting. Uh, I know it's not easy and I'm sure you have gone through a lot of uh, struggle yourself just to establish your work, uh, uh, even if you're from Uganda or Africa, it's, it's tough. So what would be your advice? Yeah, so um, one, when I was at Columbia University, what I used to do, I used to tell students that first of all, in some cases it worked out, some cases it didn't, when you think about international work, and you know, there's different levels of international work. You are, can work for the UN and you are doing international work. Yeah. That's not what interests me. Yeah. But I always tell people that if you are really going to work in the countries I just showed you, the I just took you on a tour, then just know that you are not going to Geneva. Just know that you are going in one of the poorest regions on earth and mentally you have to be ready. I'm telling you, I've taken people to Uganda and some of them have left before they even, you know, before their time is over. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do international work, get a person like Dr. Niraj Kosho. Get a person who is really, frankly, who is doing work. She's doing work in India. Engage with her. Find out generally what does it mean for me to go with you to India or for me to go and work in, in, in India? What connections do you have? Not just simply visit. Of course, you can do a visit and that kind of stuff. But what does it take? So when I was at Columbia, students who wanted to work with me, I used to tell them, I want you to take my course in the summer, in the fall. And then if you are going to go to Uganda or Kenya or one of the countries where I work, you'll go in January, but I want you to be there for at least six months. OK? I want you to. so. So the reason I get students to, en to, to enroll in my class is not because I want more students to teach, but it's because I'm going to give the examples and then students, some of them may say, you know what, that's not for me, okay? So for example, 
during COVID, we wake up uh, here, here in New York, here in, in St. Louis, I wake up by seven because, because of the time difference. And all my students, I need them to be on call because we are going to be talking to people in Ghana. We are going to be talking to people in Uganda. They are nine hours ahead of us. Yeah. So if we are going to get them, then we need to be able to think about what time do we wake up here for us to get on that call. Then two, when you are, are taking my courses or you know Dr. Neraj Kosho's courses or whatever, you really see all this in action. So for someone who wants to do global work, engage with the faculty member who's already doing this because the faculty member is not going to judge you. None of us started with global work. But two, just know that <laughs> depends on the work you really want to do. But in most cases, you're not going to Geneva. And then, and then three, for, for researchers, uh, Colombia used to have a small, uh, in fact, that's how I started. They used to have a small, um, and I think, I hope I gave you guys credit. They used to have a small pilot funding. Collect the data, get the data that you need for you to really show that there is interest in the work that you want to do. That's for researchers. If you're going to be a researcher, you need the data, pilot funding, pilot work for you to show that, yeah, I can do this. So for me, what launched me was that pilot work that I worked on when I was at Columbia. And, uh, and really that was very helpful. So, I mean, some of that is off the top of my head, but I'm sure there are, there are probably books which have been written, but sometimes unfortunately those books don't work because sometimes people are not able to really prepare you for what you are going to find in the field. But, uh, but that's some of the things that I could tell someone. Fred, I have a very specific question. I'm not sure whether uh, you can uh, answer that, but let me just still ask from uh, one of the attendees. What are your thoughts on donors supporting uh, Christian orphanages in, uh, in Uganda? Uh, I, I don't work with orphanages. So I, 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 I just think that, you know, not even think that anyone, anyone who has done work around you know, orphanhood, they know that the best way to raise a child, the best way for the kid to do well is with a family. So, so young people in Uganda, and actually I'm working in Azerbaijan now with a former student of ours, trying to do deinstitutionalization. They are better off kept in their families. We better think about how do we empower families so that they can take care of their kids. Now, the problem with orphanages, again, I don't work with orphanages. I've designed a couple of studies for me to be able to do what you call deinstitutionalization. I've never been funded mm -hmm. for that. But the problem with orphanages is that it's like having an oasis in a, in a, in a, in a, in a desert. So kids in the orphanages are taken care of so well, they have whatever, and the kids around the area are not taken care of. So every parent, even those ones who may be able to afford them, they may be able to take them into the orphanages. And actually, this is very true for Azerbaijan where we are working, but also it's true in Uganda. So in Uganda, I work for the Red Cross and the Red Cross has a service called tracing. So if you go to the Red Cross, you'll find that probably 90%, don't quote me on this, but probably 90% of the kids have a relative that they can live with. But the relative is not willing to take them in because they are because of issues of poverty and all that kind of stuff. They don't have anywhere to take them. I could have grown up in an orphanage if my uncle didn't take me in and whatever, probably. I don't know how I would have turned out, but I'm lucky I didn't grow up in an orphanage. I grew up in a, a family, but being supported. So my views are that I, you know, maybe orphanages have a role for those who are extremely, they don't have anywhere for sure, but they shouldn't be the first line of defense for young people often. That's, that's my view, but yeah. There is another uh, question that's specific to your work. Uh, this question is, have you ran into technical barriers uh, you know, during uh, using Zoom and what are some of the strategies that you've used to uh, to overcome these barriers? Yeah, there are always barriers because, you know, sometimes the connection doesn't work, uh, but um, um, so the connection sometimes doesn't work. Sometimes you want to talk to people in Uganda and they don't have, 
you know, you can only talk to them over the phone. And then sometimes, you know, for sure you are being recorded or whatever in, in the country. And, you know, but as long as you're not a politician, that's fine. So uh, then sometimes, uh, so, so yeah, there are always lots of barriers there, you know, and I never want to put money at the forefront, but frankly, you need the resources for you to be able to do this work well. You really, then you need the commitment of the institution where you are for you to do, be able to do this work well. Because everyone, the word international social work is very sexy, really. But when you now start thinking about where are the resources, you know? So if someone is going to give you $3,000 and they think that you do grow international work, that's forget about it. Because that's simply a ticket to get you from here to Nairobi or to, you know, or to Uganda or to Ghana. Ghana is slightly cheaper because in the north. Now, then you start thinking about living allowance and that kind of stuff. So you need the resources definitely, but also you need to be appreciated by the people where you are going to work. So you need to appreciate them first yourself. But also we have a lot of people and, you know, so we have a lot, I have a lot of colleagues who, who have been in these areas a short, a, a very short period of time and they think they know it all. So they argue with you and then you ask them, yeah, I was there two weeks. And you're like, you know, but those two weeks. So those are challenges, always educating people that not everyone in Africa is running naked, not everyone. So I, I take students and, and these students, sometimes they take pictures that I've never seen. Then I say, where did you find that? And because always sometimes you, you are, you are fighting with people who want to make it more Hollywood, mm. you know, they want to show the worst of it. And yet, you know, they, there is strength, there is weaknesses. So those are all challenges emotionally. Mm. I recently took students and students refused to enter in a, in a, a mental health facility because, you know, their argument didn't make sense to me. But, but so these are challenges that you really have to educate people Mm -hmm. But you also have to, to be very careful for you not to be misinterpreted that you know, you're being defensive. So those are anyway, there's financial challenges, emotional challenges, really getting people who are committed to this work who are not you know, academic tourists who just want to go and add something on their CV. So those are all challenges, but you know, how do you decide who is who? So. Well, there's one question that's specific to one of these challenges. This is about, uh, uh, does the go uh, Ugandan government's oppressive policies towards the LGBT community interfere with your work? Yeah, they, they, it, it, it does. It does interfere with the work because, you know, IRB, it becomes very difficult for you. So in Uganda, just like in other place, but here it's different. Okay. You have the institutional review board, the local review board that has to sign off on your research. They want, they want to make sure that human subjects are protected. Now, after that, you can't still do the study until it goes through the president's office, which is really the arm, which is really oversees Uganda National Council of Science and Technology. So, I mean, if there is a, if, if you are going to ask questions around this, some of the issues that the government is opposed to, then I'm assuming that, you know, they, you know, that's not my area, but I'm assuming that then you have challenges in terms of getting it through. If you get it through IRB, because it's science, then it may not be, you may not be able to get the research permit to do the work, probably. Um, thanks for that. I mean, uh, yeah, these challenges uh, are really, can really uh, affect your work. Uh, there is a question which is specific to one of the papers that you were presenting uh, relating to some of your work. And the question is, who controls the savings? How long is it, is the savings, is the money saved? And does it go for a particular reason? For example, schooling, university, housing. So the savings that the students have, how, is it, how are they being used? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Also, just like others were excellent, but that allows me to clarify, yeah. So the savings are like a foreign care plan in a way. And so you are restricted. So we have different types of savings. I have to pull back. So the savings for kids in schools, we have restricted them to education or starting a small business. 
the savings for kids in the clinics, we have restricted them to education, starting a small business, or verifiable medical treatment or medical care. And we allow people, they have to go through this financial literacy training, and we allow people to be able to access the saving, the much savings. So we open up two accounts. One of the accounts is for the participant. That's their money. But the match is kept in a different account. We only figure out the, how to match it. And we only, you know, they only uh, access this money if they are meeting the goal that they saved for. And so when the kid is ready to go to school or to pay for an educational purpose, if it's a match of one-to-one, -one, then they'll get 50% of their money out of their savings account, which is verifiable. They'll send it to the school and we'll get the 50% from this match savings account and send it to the school. So that's how it works. Same way with a, a vendor who is uh, starting a small business. Now, who controls the saving? The kid begins controlling the saving at age 18 because then they're of majority, but understand now the government of Uganda, by the way, when we started, it was a whole tricky issue, but anyway, they are thinking about getting it to age 16, which is very good. It will be part of our impact. And the caregiver is on the account just in trust of. So our program is not on the account at all, the account for the kid. Our, our program is not on the account at all or even the NGOs that we work with. We just control the match itself. Now, we also have uh, the study that I mentioned about that where um, Susan, uh, 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 Dr. Susan Whitty, who is your colleague, is part of as an MPI. That is a study for women who are engaged in sex work. And for that account, there are no restrictions. So they can access their savings whenever they want it. But the way we are keeping and getting to know how women are spending their savings is by allowing them to keep what we call a financial diary. And so using a financial diary, each day they spend money and money, we are able to tell that this is where they got the money from, this is how they are spending it. And the reason we didn't want to put restrictions is because again, these are mature people. We don't want to be very paternalistic, although you will say, Fred, why are you paternalistic on the kids in, in schools? But give them a chance to decide how they want to spend their money. And for us as researchers, let's figure out how is this money being spent? And again, it's a, it's a researchable question, and it was a question that we incorporated so that we can learn, learn more uh, around these issues. Fred, I have a question from uh, Dean Beck, and I have been frankly thinking of the same thing, that your work is so interdisciplinary. It spans economics, public health, social work, uh, and interdisciplinary work is really hard. And on top of that, you're working across regions, national borders, time zones. So the question is, what are your strategies to keep these uh, complicated projects on track? Uh, the trick is just, you know, really trying to train people on their own. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, they, they, so there are several, I'll say a few things here. One, my ego, you know, I may look up, you know, whatever, but people have worked with me. You know, I don't care about a publication, frankly. And even when I remember when I was joining Columbia University, one to someone told me, you know, you are going, because I had offers at two top schools, you know, back in 2003, you are going to Columbia University and you want to get tenure. And I said, you know what? If I don't get tenure at Columbia, someone else would want me. Because for me, it's not about that publication. Oh, if, by, by the way, I got tenure and got promoted. So, so that, you know. So. So the issue is you really have to believe in what you do and think about how do I surround myself with a, the right group of people, okay? It's not about Fred at the forefront. In fact, if you pull up my CV, most of my students lead our publications. I may be leading the conceptualization, but most of my students lead those publications for purpose because you need to train people to take over from you or to work with you. So that's what, that's one. But two, I'm never intimidated by level of intelligence that people have. I always believe that we can learn. I always told people, even when we are getting new faculty and people are being voted down and, and oh, because people don't know, you know, that one is more, may, may shine more than me. I say, when someone is good on a team, 
the entire team will shine. That's what I believe in. So the last thing that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about how we've been able to do this is the whole concept around really community engagement and engaging people from a very early age, a very early stage. So when we go to Ghana, we train people in Ghana for them to be able to do this with or without Fred. When you are in Uganda, you set up a real operation for them to do this with or without Fred. When you go to Kenya, you do the same thing. So that allows you to kind of uh, pull back and say, okay, then, you know, it doesn't have to be Fred, Fred, Fred. So here at Washington University, I have a, a colleague, I have a team of colleagues, including, you know, young professionals, early career, whatever, you know, the Ozigis, the Proces, the Rachels, the, I mean, the Williams. So I have a team of young professionals who are taking this really on even without Fred. And I always tell them in two years, I will retire and they say, no, you can't retire. I say, but at some point you will have to take on. So, uh, so Dean Melissa, I think the way really I look at this work, it's not about me. It's about the cause that every people, people really have that we are concerned about families. We are concerned about children. Whoever name is at the forefront, that's, that's whatever, you know, I don't need to get a Nobel prize, but for as long as the communities that we work with are really being impacted. And that's why I have that now line of capacity building that I talked about now applying for, you know, anyone who does <laughs> training grants, no, it's not a lot of money. It's about 200 and is it 50,000? So you could, you would, and then you need more work than any other O1, which is half a million. So you, you have to think about, do I really just, you know, want me, me, me at the forefront, or do I really want to think about a pipeline of people who can do this work with me, but also without me? That's what I've done. Wow, this was such a great presentation. I have learned a lot. You're very inspirational. I'm going to end with a lovely remark from one of your former students. I don't have the name here. Uh, this person took your class uh, in 2003 as a graduate student at CUSSW. And she says, your knowledge, passion, commitment to maintaining integrity and dignity of this work has guided me throughout my career. What a gift to see you present today. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, that makes my week. Thank you so much, that <laughs> really, thank you so much, whoever that was who said that, thank you so much. I mean, you know, yeah, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And by the way, I'm sweating because they told me I have to keep this here so that they can see my face. Otherwise, you know, yeah. Thank you, Fred. Um, well, th thanks to both of you uh, for a really comprehensive and wide-ranging and inspirational discussion. Uh, both Dr. Suwamala and Dr. Koshal, uh, we're all really grateful, everybody in the audience. You've reminded us why social workers absolutely must study the relationship between poverty and health, uh, and that what we can learn in one region of the world, despite the differences, can be applied in another. Uh, and also thank you for your beautiful advice at the other, Dr. Sumala. Believe in what you do and, and prepare others to carry that work forward, both in the academy and the community. Uh, those are excellent words of advice for all of us to take away from this session. So um, again, thanks. Thanks to everyone and best wishes to everybody for joining us. Okay, thank you so much. Bye.